Well, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> um, tough act to follow from me, from Elaine, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give it the best shot. I think perhaps the title wasn't the sexiest. Um, I'm not sure I've come, I've come and listened to this title myself, but I'm thinking it. However, I will endeavour to make it um, interesting because I think it is, it is really, really interesting. Um, the aims are to look at how, well, I'll let you read them because Anna came up to me and said, I hope you don't put slides up and then read them out. <laughs> so I could do that myself. So therefore, I will not read that out. Um, suffice to say, I just want to share with you what's worked for us, the challenges we faced, and, and also what, what didn't work. Because some of the stuff we've done, surprisingly, <coughs> hasn't actually worked. Just a little bit on the cooperative group there, our history, formed in 1844 by a, a group of blokes who were concerned that food at the time was being... Um, altered, um, metal filings were being put into flour and all sorts of horrible stuff was going on. So this, was, this was formed to make sure that people were getting the food at the right price, decent quality, and that um, also moved into things like education and our own factories and everything. So that's where we came from. The important bit on there is just the bit that highlights there. We're owned by our members and we're a democratic structure, so we're not a PLC. Okay, we're a funny, funny sort of thing. Anybody that Shops of us and buys, uh, spends a pound, invests a pound, becomes a member. So we are run by our members, which helps steer what we do. So we aren't wholly driven by the financial um, motive. It's an important one because if we don't make any money, we can't reinvest any money, but it's not our driving force. There's our businesses uh, funeral care, pharmacy, farms, electrical, banking group. We're in the throes of hopefully buying 700 banks uh, off of Lloyd. Travel estates, and the one that you're probably most familiar with, the one I do most of my work with, is, is food. There's two and a half thousand shops across every postcode in the UK. Just want to go back in time. These are very grainy images. I, I'm sorry I downloaded them on Blackberry last night. Uh, 2006, seven, Al Gore, um, fresh from not winning the uh, presidential election. Um, Launched his Inconvenient Truth, which was one of the big, big films of 2006-07. Um, had Hurricane Katrina, energy costs were spiralling, it was the big thing. Everybody was into the environment and, and doing, doing what they could. So we set ourselves a, a goal as a, as a food business of reducing our energy consumption by 25% between 2006 and 20, 2011. Okay, that's a huge amount. At the moment we use about 0.5 of the entire UK's energy usage from the cooperative route itself. Okay, so it's a big, big old user. We had 2,800 shops, the first estate, 60,000 colleagues, etc., etc. No structure was in place to actually help us do anything. And energy saving wasn't seen as part of uh, business as usual. If anything, it was seen as a bit tree huggy, a bit woolly. Those of you that would have seen the um, spoof 2012 during the summer. I loved it and I hated it for that damn woman who was in charge of sustainability because it was, was um, and also some of it also was a bit too close to the bone when they had to move six bins because there were six beetles and that was all, I was thinking, oh, love me, I put it in sound like that. So we had all that to contend with. So we created a team from scratch, there's one national energy manager and then six energy managers for the country, but I'm one of them, I look after Wales and West Country. We needed our full executive for support. We needed operations, which basically the blokes who run the shops, the ladies and the blokes who run the shops, and we needed our energy department support as well. We got support from a top, that's Peter Marks, our chief executive. Um, remember, did you interview him? No, no you didn't no, get to him. No, you, you wouldn't have got to him. Um, he's basically saying that businesses have to do things differently. We can't just be driven by the uh, financial savings. We have a bigger responsibility. Um, so we've got, thank you very much, Peter, that's very, very helpful. And also from our members, which we talked about earlier, we've come up with our ethical operating plan. It isn't as sexy as m &S's. plan A, I know, but they got there first. We could hardly call our plan B, because that sounds terrible. <laughs> um, so it's ethical operating policy, which is pants as a title, but never mind. Our, yeah. Supporting cooperatives across the, the, the entire globe, this is the International Year for Cooperatives. There are um, a billion people who are members of cooperatives around the world. Tackling global poverty, responsible retailing, responsible finance, which is even more important nowadays, and actually it was when that plan was drawn up. Inspiring young people, 
keeping communities thriving, the bit that really is, is what I'm about is, is protecting the environment. So that drives what we do. Of course we've got to make a profit, we have to make a profit in order to invest in our stores and for it to be in the future, but that is underpinning what we do. Uh, let's go on to that next one. These are our goals, and the biggest ones, I think, we're making energy tangible, making it real to the people in the stores, working on engagement with our colleagues in the stores, and build long-term plans and establish clear policies and procedures so that it becomes business as usual. People do it without thinking, so they don't have to keep thinking, what should I do, which is sustainable. It's already there in, in what, everything they do. A three-pronged attack. Refit programmes, which is where we... Um, we get a store every five years, we upgrade it, we put new stuff in, that's a refit. It's retrofits or anything that isn't going to be refitted, but it's stuff we do to save energy. And good housekeeping is all about behavioural change. The beauty of it is it's free, or relatively free, compared with refits and retrofits, which cost a lot of money. So us being us, we went for the cheap option first. Um, let's try and change what people's behaviours are. So we, we have to try and find out what behaviours should be promoted who we're looking at, who are we targeting, and, uh, and what conditions individuals they face in the stores. I've worked in a store, it's my origin, I started off as a store manager many, many minutes ago. It isn't easy, it's a tough old environment. Um, there isn't a lot of slack, there aren't people around scratching their heads about what to do. So we have to be, anything we did had to be relevant to them. It's no good telling them to do something if they simply haven't got the people in the store to do it. So, Using our collective knowledge, because we're all most of us were ex-retailers, we designed this picture, which just as energy housekeeping in store. Well, I've just put up a handful of icons, just so you can see my work. Get back. Thank you. Um, energy blinds, the night blinds, which we were talking about earlier. Uh, if you put a night blind down on a fridge in a shop that saves you 100 quid a year per bay, okay? So if you've got 30 bays of fridges in your store, it costs you to save you three grand a year. They cost £100 to install, £100 divided by £100 is one year payback. So we can invest the money, but unless someone pulls it down, it's a waste of time. So that's a housekeeping thing. Air conditioning units, 21 degrees is what they're sat at. They're designed to run at 21, but whenever it happens, when it gets freezing cold, people turn them up to 28, and when it's very hot, they turn them down to 16. AC units don't do that. They only operate between 21 to 23 degrees. So it's all in the mind. So again, people stop turning your blinking fridge, these things up. Another one, your booze chillers. We had them running at the same temperature as you would for your pies and your meat. You don't need to because you're not going to kill anyone if your wine's at 8 degrees as opposed to 1 degree. Okay, so we turned them down, we saved loads of money, so we weren't actually spending much money on these sort of things. And cardboard and plastic, if you separate it at source, we can earn £10 million a year simply from doing that. So that was a housekeeping thing and we, were, we wanted to get that across to the people in the stores. But it isn't simple, it's not as simple as sending out a, a, a poster or a newsletter or whatever. People, for some reason, don't always do what we might think is obvious. Partly because they don't know about it or what the benefits are. Partly because they think there's insurmountable things. I can't do that because it's too hard to whatever. And simply sometimes because they know all the benefits and they can't be arsed, if I'm honest. They can't be bothered to separate the carbon and plastic because it's easier just to dump it into the skip and wave goodbye to the landfill. It's not being recorded, is it? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> um, these are the things which I, I can't claim that are original. Um, in fact, I gleaned them from this book, Fostering Sustainable Behaviour. Um, that one's probably most important. People gravitate to actions that benefit them the most and inconvenience the least. Okay. Box standard, I'm sure you're all... I'm not a, I'm not a psychologist, I'm a grocer turned... Whatever I am now, which is a curious hybrid of engineer, psychologist, grocer, and all sorts of things. People's benefits vary between individuals, and different behaviours compete with be different behaviours. So, someone who walks to work, oh, sorry, whose best benefit will be to walk to work, so it's very, very green, might prefer catching a taxi, or but then you might prefer catching the bus. There's all sorts of different things. It makes I didn't explain that very well, but it, it's kind of it's, it's not very clear. So you can either increase the benefits decrease the barriers, decrease the benefits of the competing behaviours, or increase the barriers of the competing behaviours. Um, we chose to, to try and decrease the barriers. Okay, well, traditional way of changing people's behaviours, you regulate, so we can say you will pull your fridge blinds down. Unfortunately, with 3,000 shops, I can't be everywhere, and I can't go around every night and check they pull the blinds down and put them up again. We can give them lots and lots of information. 
Um, and then we can say, look, you'll save yourself loads and loads of money. And there's an element of all that to everybody, uh, to everything. People will be re regulated if, um, sorry, their willingness to be regulated will influence our ability to regulate. Um, information can change behavior, but on, own, on its own it can't. There's lots of studies that, where people were bombarded with information, they still don't know anything about it. Um, and we, we can see that everywhere. And promoting economic self-behavior, so you'll save yourself 100 pounds a year on its own, won't do it. Because to Johnny, who works eight hours a week on the tills in, on the yards of Silly, he's not going to be particularly fussed that they'll save 100 pounds for every fridge blind he turns down. It's just not going to happen. We're, we're, we're being naive if you want. What social psychology has said is, initiatives to promote behavior change are most effective when it's carried out at community level, and it involves direct contact with people. And that's quite tricky when there's only one of me for 600 shops and there's only six of us for 2,800. But more on that a little bit later. Okay, so we're looking at a community-based approach. We're told by all the books, textbooks tell us this is the best way of doing it. We've got different communities, we have different priorities, we have, so we have to adopt different tactics. All right? This wasn't quite the picture I was after. Um, this is after some, some Boer commandos, commandos in the Boer War, when they just, it says, waiting for the enemy, well, that was us. <laughs> what I tried to get over was the, the impact of small groups operating cleverly to make a big impact. So I then Googled it again. I came up with the Gorilla Nang, this is what I came up found. A member of an unofficial military group that is trying to change the government by making sudden unexpected attacks on the official army. Which wasn't quite what I was after. <laughs> no, that's not quite what I mean. What I mean is, and there's our six, it's an adjective, it's not a noun, and it means using unusual methods to get attention for your ideas and products, etc. But thank goodness for that, that's the one I was after. Okay? So, for instance, like guerrilla marketing, which has become quite uh, popular. So, we needed to recruit our own guerrilla army in quickly. So, we, appoint, we recruited 2,500 champions, one for every store, and then one area champion for every area, so they had 15 stores each. I won't claim that that was... Not every single champion that was recruited actually knew that they were the champion. That was a bit of a problem. <laughs> On some, I would walk into a store in Dorset Dar and say, you're the, area cha you're the energy champion, aren't you? Am I? Well, I didn't know until I had me, me review. <laughs> When they were good, they were excellent. They were very, very good. Okay, but there were some that slipped through the net and ended up doing it because when they had the annual review, uh, what should we do? And I said, uh, no, it's happened. All right, and we were excellent. And, and we were kid be kidding myself if I, was, if I said I had 650 very well-trained, highly motivated champions. However, we had a bulk of them were, and they did make a big difference. We didn't really want to bombard them with too much of the big picture. I have to choose my audience very carefully to who I put this slide up with, but I thought I'd be quite safe here. Yeah. Um, so on our membership presentation, I chose to censor that a little bit. Um, because if you look at all that, we, it's easy to get really, really bogged down. It's a huge problem. I have to say, I don't quite share any optimism <laughs> about the future, if I'm honest. I think the two degrees thing that people are after, forget it, we've, it's gone. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna restrict it to two. We'll be lucky to restrict it to three or four. A lot of it now is going to be to do with mitigation rather than prevention, and that's a really sad thing, but I fear that may be what we're heading towards. So we thought, well, we'll give them bits of that, but we're not going to give it all. Um, in order for them to make some improvements into their energy-saving performance and behaviours, we've got to measure what we're doing. So we put smart meters in every single store, and then we came up with this. And did anyone would like to describe their initial reactions to seeing that? Please be as honest as you wish. It's exciting as ours would be too. It is. Yes. It's, it's dull, it's boring, you look at it and go, oh no. And we couldn't get some main board directors to understand it. Oh dear. So this is all about the feedback that people, it's no good giving people what we think they want, we've got to give them what they want. Uh, which has been alluded to a lot of workshops this morning. Um, so we, we, we stripped it back, we paired it back. So now, every store is benchmarked, as much as you benchmark a fridge, A to G, A is very good, A1 is very good. A G5 is awful. Um, this store here, the target is D3. Sorry, they start at D3. Their target is C3. For every period they hit, that period is a four week financial period. They say for 250 quid on the bottom line. It's a lot easier. People get it. The previous one they didn't get. Some of us didn't get it either. We designed it. So 
um, to learn in there. Another one, day-night report. This measures the amount of energy that the the amount of energy drops at night when everybody's gone home and the blinds are pulled down. This store's target is 55%, so the energy should drop by 55% at night. This one's only doing 38, its target's 55. Again, it's very simple. You can see the, the progress throughout the year. 38, 38, 40, 41, 44, 45. So it's getting better, but it's still not quite there. But again, very, very simple. They go out every period, every four weeks. The store's on an energy notice board like that. And again, We've got five different segments. I wish now we didn't have five different segments because we've now got to fill up five different segments every four weeks and it gets very, very hard to be different and to be original and to get them to put it up. But we're persevering with it because we know if we let that go, we won't get it back in again. Okay, so we, you know, just have, we just have to persevere. For the, the meat-eating um, retailers that we have, we do measure the consumption on a, on a competitive basis, this is the, the managers for the South Western Wales, Dave Evans, who's North Wales. This target for period date, which was August, was 2.6 million kilowatts. He, uh, he hit 2.57, so he's 57 kilowatt, thousand kilowatts better, so that's five or six thousand pounds. So they get a bit excited about that, so he puts it on their bottom line. And Dave is better than Chris, so Chris gets annoyed, Dave gets very cocky, and there's a bit of competition, and that's very, very good, because we like a bit of competition. Anyone who's in a management position can't stand being down there, they can't stand red numbers, so that's good. Um, that works very, very well. We took the champions out, the area champions out, we trained them. Just a couple points on that. We trained them on wasting energy at home and store, reasoning being if they change their behaviours at home, they change their behaviours at work, and if they change their behaviours at work, they change their behaviours at, at home as well. So it worked really, really well. And we also looked at the problems that they might face, and we gave them four questions. If you're talking to someone, oops. if you're talking to someone and they said those things to you, what would you do? Who cares about the co-op? Polar bears, stuff them. Why should I help the co-op save money? It's not mine, and so on and so on. So it kind of gave them. And another thing we talked about as well, the 80-20 rule. There are 20% of people that will never get it, that don't want to change. And we said, well, don't bother. Don't bother with them. Don't waste your time. They're never going to change. Even if they're sat on the top of Snowden and the waters are washing over their feet, they will still not get climate change. So don't bother. Go for those that can be persuaded and will make changes. Because you've only got so much time, you've only got so much money, talking about how much time, haven't we? Present time. Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> don't do it. And it's shared, there was sharing that people were finding it frustrating, we were finding it frustrating, and it helps to target your resources. Because there aren't many of us. We attended conferences, we got into people's faces in a nice way, um, but it keeps that awareness going. We did the usual internal comms. I'm not sure how many people read an internal comms magazine, unless they're in it, in which case they read them all. Um, I don't know. I, mean, I, I, I could be being, but again, it's you're keeping your, you, you're keeping, you're pitching, you're keeping your face there, you're getting people, you're getting your noticed, okay? So you, you have to do these things anyway. Um, and it certainly meant a lot to the store concerned to be in that magazine. I've done loads of resources. as our uh, energy newsletter, uh, sorry, the energy notice board. We've run various campaigns, dead or alive, that wanted for crimes against energy, burning the midnight oil, that's a picture of a store with all the lights on. It's a Sainsbury's. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the only one I could find. Um, and I didn't really want to drive around our stores in the dead of night to take some photos, so I just tapped into Google, supermarket with lights on at night, and it came up with that. But it was happening. <laughs> I won't make any, anyone's ideas. Um, but we did have stores that were doing that, leaving their lights on, not pulling their blinds down. And there's our friend, the air conditioning as well. Uh, we've got the internet as well, that's up and running. The only thing of internet, if you're gonna do them, they've got to be up to date, because it's dead embarrassing when you go on and say, new I turn 2011 campaign is. You say, oh, great, the minute you see that, you just say, well, if you can't be bothered to do it properly, I can't be bothered to read it. So it's, they're very good, but boy, you've got to have, and, and don't underestimate how, many, how much resource actually has to go in there to keep them going, because they are, Work. Okay, so we want to give our champions something to do and say, look, you're not just going around telling people to turn light bulbs off, you can make a real difference. So, T12s, one of my specialities is lighting. An exciting life, I leave. Um, and T12, T12 is the width of the light tube. Old fashioned, it's obsolete now, they're not made in the country anymore. Um, there's some unscrupulous beggars who bought them all up before they were made illegal and around warehouses and everywhere else. They use loads and loads of power, they give off loads and loads of heat, they're terrible. So we did a campaign, 